I believe that this book's sleeper agent is up for an Edgar Award. Is that yeah. right? Okay. So um, just very excited. Please help me welcome Anne Hagedorn. How's that? Let's see, testing. Working? Okay, great. Well, <clears throat> to say the least, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for all attending. I see some familiar faces there. It's always terrific. Uh, books have the power to bring people together. Uh, to me, they are the magic portals that connect us to each other and to the past, as well as to the present, with hopes for the future, of course. As I always say, when I'm in this library, uh, it was here many years ago that <coughs> makes me teary-eyed, sorry. <coughs> Uh, that I fell in love with books. Ah, so thank you, Wright Library. Okay, so I'd like to extend special thanks to Elizabeth Schmidt, who has been very smart and patient over the past two years as she has adjusted the schedule of library lectures like this one to surrounding events. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> applause for Elizabeth. And today I'll discuss my latest book, Sleeper Agent, offering you a glimpse into the research, writing, surprises, significance, and challenges uh, of a book like this. So to begin, uh, I have to bring up the subject of the genre narrative nonfiction. I'm sort of locked into that genre with great passion and devotion. Uh, it is, in short, about using literary techniques to tell true stories. <clears throat> it requires the research and fact-checking of nonfiction and the literary structures of fiction. So it's a fabulous mix, a melding of two skill sets. I consider my job as a narrative nonfiction writer to seek the truth and to pick topics significant <laughs> to the American public. And then using the facts unearthed from thorough research and reporting uh, to engage readers through the art of storytelling. And I dare say it's more than a job for me now. It's really uh, more of a calling. My quest is always to find the compelling narrative that will bring alive for the reader all issues and individuals at the core of the book's topic. And often I'm asked, how do you choose your topics? Well, excuse me. First of all, each topic must have significance, possibly be in danger of falling through the cracks, uh, in danger of being missed by the general reader. It must have literary potential, which means that you know it must have uh, lively characters, individuals, and lively scenes. Uh, fabulous settings to be very descriptive and to use, uh, you know, literary techniques to put them to good use. Uh, it must be doable research-wise. It must have general reader appeal. It must, you know, uh, make all of you, every single one of you, want to buy it and read it. So, um, and it must be a fresh narrative. And perhaps most importantly, it must rouse my writerly passions. So first you choose the topic, then find the best narrative to bring it alive for the general reader. That's the usual sequence. <clears throat> but this time with Sleeper Agent, I discovered a remarkable story first, one that grabbed me from the start and that became Sleeper Agent. It all began with a 92 year old gentleman I was interviewing for a book topic in 2016. This was one of those topics that is intellectually important, in danger of falling through the cracks, but lacking a compelling narrative. It had an interesting timeline, a few very dynamic individuals, and a solid historical backdrop. But I kept hitting walls as I tried to find the human story that would move the general reader into the topic and keep them there. It was only basically a factual account. It was very encyclopedic. So I think the man I was interviewing clearly sensed my frustration. 
he also knew that I had grown up in Dayton, Ohio. And so toward the end of the interview, he asked if I knew about the secret site in Dayton tied to the highly secretive Manhattan Project. A while ago, he said someone had told him that a Soviet spy worked there and at such, at such a site in Dayton during World War II. Perhaps the spy even lived in the same community where I had spent my childhood, he said. For a week or so after the interview, I continued my pursuit of details for the other story. But then brimming with curiosity, I took time off to explore what the gentleman had told me. I had no name for the spy and I was skeptical, of course. It was probably just a rumor. Spy stories are so often embellished or not even true. But a great mix of skepticism and curiosity spurred me on. So I made a few calls. I checked some details on the internet, something I always tell students, don't do that first. <laughs> go, go to libraries and find archives, you know, but for this, in this case, it was okay to do. Uh, rather quickly, I found the name of a World War II Soviet spy in the New York Times story published in 2007. George Koval was his name. <clears throat> The article was about Vladimir Putin giving a posthumous award to Koval for helping the Soviets develop their first atomic bomb. There was a mention of both Oak Ridge and Dayton. Voila. Next, I made three lists, what seemed to be known about this spy, what was clearly unknown, and I would have to reveal if telling his story and writing his biography, and where there might be helpful archives, much needed primary sources. And then came what I call the flight plan, a schedule for the research. Uh, <clears throat> calling the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and gaining wisdom about the latest on how to best use the Freedom of Information Act to acquire the FBI reports was very important, as was visiting the National Park Archives in College Park, Maryland, plus some invaluable interviews in the DC area. The DC trip was definitely the turning point. From then on, as several in the audience today can definitely confirm, I was on it and I barely took a day off from the process of finding letters, journals, postcards, news clips, yearbooks, photos, maps, tax records, ship manifests, passports, arrest records, application forms, even inscriptions in books and that thousands, <clears throat> altogether about 6,000 pages of FBI reports. Do read the acknowledgments section of the book and, uh, and the notes to get a sense of the scope of the research. There was also the regimen of reading applicable secondary sources in the numerous topical domains from the 20th century antisemitism in Russia and America to the Soviet espionage tactics and networks in 1930s and 1940s America, to the timelines of the making of the atomic bombs in the United States and in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> in especially the manufacture, uh, well, and, and of course there was the nuclear science, especially the manufacture of the element polonium, including a 410 page document on polonium, published by the Atomic Energy Commission in 1956. All of this uh, in the pursuit of putting together the pieces of the life of a Soviet uh, military intelligence officer who, as Elizabeth told you, uh, served as a US Army corporal and had full security clearance in America's top secret World War II project to build the first atomic bomb. The who and the when were very doable on the challenges list. I was soon confident about that, but for it to be a true biography, the why, the what, and the how had to be flushed out. Not so easy to find such details when you're uh, telling the story of the life of a spy. They don't exactly leave uh, a visible trail for future biographers especially one who was never caught. 
uh, like George Cowell, and thus there are no trial transcripts uh, to refer to. Still, it was doable, and Sleeper Agent is indeed the biography of a Soviet trained spy, uh, one who was uh, born and raised in Iowa, who was known for charming everyone he met, who happened to love baseball. Uh, some of this Elizabeth already told you was a skilled shortstop and could reel off the history and stats of every big league pitcher. He played bridge. Uh, he belonged to two bowling leagues. He could recite uh, verses from Walt Whitman and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, such as Longfellow's poem, The Village Blacksmith, which was apparently his favorite. Quote, thus at the flaming fortune forge of life, our fortunes must be wrought. <clears throat> and he was, by several accounts, quite the ladies' man. A true American, or so it seemed, actually a true American trader. All the while, he was sending atomic secrets to Moscow uh, to help speed up the creation of their own atomic bomb, and he was never caught, as the subtitle of the book tells you. Cobo was the perfect sleeper agent, which by the way is defined often in events lately, people ask what exactly is a sleeper agent? It's a spy without legal diplomatic cover. One who blends into everyday life in the target country, working in normal jobs. In this case, Cobo worked at an electronics shop on West 23rd Street in Manhattan while living in the Bronx. And he became a corporal in the US Army during World War II, quite an excellent cover. Like all spy stories, uh, the book gives readers the expected intrigue of some espionage details. The code names, the various cover shops in Manhattan, the apartments in the Bronx, the handler and his suspicious routines. I had quite an adventure finding the addresses of the cover shops and then visiting the premises, even interviewing current owners, letting them know that their property had once been used as a cover shop for Soviet spies. They were thrilled, actually. Uh, and uh, one has actually turned uh, one of those shops into a uh, bar that uh, has photos of spies on the walls. <clears throat> so at any rate, uh, yeah, what authors can do for a neighborhood. But um, yeah. <laughs> visiting the premises, uh, even interviewing current owners about the history of the buildings and measuring distances. This is where the real adventure came in from the main cover shop on West 23rd Street in Manhattan to the Flatiron Building, which many of you know about the Flatiron Building in New York, where meetings had taken place with Kobel's handler and with other members of the network. It took five <laughs> minutes, by the way. Yeah. So, but the book goes beyond that, for the biography delves into uh, the psychology of the spy. It hopefully shows uh, the hopes, fears, and beliefs that influenced his decisions and inspired his accomplishments. Everyone's life must have meaning. And I wanted to unveil the people and events that shaped the meaning in Kobel's to immerse the reader into the historical context in which a spy functioned, uh, to basically deepen the themes and significance of a typical spy story and bring the reader into what I call the human constants, uh, speak to the human condition. After reading an early copy of Sleeper Agent, my friend Nick Clooney told me that Koval's biography basically connected him to the intensity of the Cold War battle of the American dream versus the communist workers' paradise. Nick said that for him, Koval's life personified that struggle, really connected him to it. A Russian scholar, knowledgeable about Koval, wrote to me months ago saying, quote, George Koval's life journey through the 20th century's American and Russian destinies and his work as an intelligence agent had such impact on world history that his personality and fate should long be the study, uh, the subject of study in both Russia and the United States. Unquote. The book also exposes the backlash of bigotry, 
the persistence of prejudice <coughs> in history, basically the human cost of oppression. Though his self-designed tapestry of lies and half-truths depicts a true traitor, Kobo was also a dedicated scientist. And he was uh, a survivor of anti-Semitism in both Russia and America. Some, someone who truly knew the human costs of oppression. The Kobol story indeed shows how people who've emigrated to America for the best of reasons, such as freedom, sometimes can be alienated by the plague of prejudice. One of the book's reviewers drew attention to that, commenting on the subtext that runs through Kobol's life story, being the quote, ugly antisemitism first in Russia, which his parents fled, escaping murderous pogroms. And then in 1917, the Russian Revolution set off a wave of antisemitism in America, claiming Jews were Bolsheviks and thus America's en enemies. This kept intensifying, unfortunately, as did the membership of the Ku Klux Klan, even in the Great Plains states, such as Iowa. And so it was that the Koval family returned to Russia in 1932, and seven years later, Koval was recruited by the Red Army and trained to be an intelligence officer. He returned to America in the autumn of 1940 as a very well trained GRU uh, Red Army officer assigned to find the latest of America's work on chemical weapons. That was his initial assignment. The Cobol narrative transcends the debates uh, about the scale of Soviet espionage in wartime America and turns the reader's attention to the scapegoating, opportunism, and bigotry that blurred the vision of what was truly happening regarding the Soviet spy networks in the US. J. Edgar Hoover knew there were such networks, uh, but, and he, he was right, but he was often hunting in the wrong territory. For example, he thought that all members of the Communist Party USA had to be spies, but look at Koval. He belonged to bowling leagues, not the Communist Party USA, and he mingled with his science, scientist peers in an electrical engineering honorary fraternity, not with his quote unquote fellow travelers as his espionage peers were called. He simply blended in. As one reviewer commented, uh, like a good novel, I'm led to an understanding of the lead character. George Kobo wasn't a killer. That's one of the fascinations of the story. You can't really hate him. And that was part of his power, that ability to blend in so well and be everyone's favorite friend. Further, Kobo's story shows the expertise and determination of Russian military intelligence and how we've often underestimated Russian capabilities in technology and science in general. As former Defense Secretary and CIA Chief James Schlesinger said at the time of the discovery of Soviet listening devices built into the structure of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow in 1985, Quote, the culprit is often American complacency, the tendency to assume that the Russians are technically inferior to us and that we can always handle them, unquote. He called that building when he testified about what had happened to that building, he called it the best bugged building ever built. <laughs> And the book uh, does indeed expose how Russia's ever more sophisticated campaign of spying all got started many decades ago, thus unveiling some of the espionage techniques the Soviets pioneered during the Cold War. And considering that there is once again a state of crisis with the Russian leadership seeking to possibly restore Soviet-like dominance over Eastern Europe, that point seems to be increasingly relevant. <laughs> Sadly. In general, Sleeper Agent answers long lingering questions about Kobol's life. It brings to light many new details. It reveals why he was undetected, and it shows there were no coincidences. As a source of mine from years ago, when I was working at the Wall Street Journal, a former uh, federal pr prosecutor, actually, I was covering federal trials in those days, 
told me when I asked him about uh, best ways to investigate a case, he said, always use timelines and chronologies and never accept coincidences. One good example of that in Sleeper Agent was Koval's enrollment at Columbia University shortly after he returned to America as a Red Army trained spy. That fact was simply a line in one of the FBI files, a line without any context. He got a B, by the way, in the course. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, it's a great example of what could appear to be a detail of little significance, but was some study, mainly timelines, about what was happening then in nuclear physics, it becomes far more important than someone taking a chemistry course at an Ivy League school because he loved science and or wanted to make uh, friends at his new home in New York City. To be sure, by the time of Koval's enrollment in 1941, Columbia had become a magnet for some of the most highly regarded physicists and chemists in the world some destined to play stellar roles in the upcoming production of the first atomic bomb. And there had been a very detailed front page article in the New York Times on May 5th, 1940, about what was happening in Columbia in physics, an article Koval's handler would definitely have seen as uh, there are definite accounts in the FBI files about how his handler read two publications each day the Daily Worker and the New York Times. So you take a detail, dig further, establish some timelines, and then the truth begins to surface. One of my favorite details was Koval's job, uh, was actually Koval's job at both, in both Dayton and Oak Ridge, I'll get to Dayton in a second, uh, as a health physicist. Uh, it was known that he was assigned to Oak Ridge. He put that on all his later forms and applications. Uh, but exactly what did he do there? What was his daily routine? And how would that affect his access to top secret information? Well, he was a health physicist. Uh, the health physics department was created uh, at Oak Ridge, health physics department in the Manhattan Project, to measure levels of radiation contamination. And such work required routine access to confidential and secret information. In fact, most, if not all information pertaining to health physics during Koval's tenure at Oak Ridge was classified. Health physicists had to learn the basic chemical properties of all the radioactive materials they were monitoring. They were asked to be present whenever repair work was done on any equipment at the plants, and no shipment could leave the site without the approval of the health physics department, which meant documentation, presence and documentation. Also, uh, the health physicists conducted routine surveys of all offices and labs as they checked for signs of contamination. Three important steps for health physicists, uh, for health physics workers were always noted in their training materials. Quote, know all operations in your area, be alert to all changes, make thorough surveys regularly. That was the job of the Soviet spy. <clears throat> Finding such details are what I call the aha moments. And there were numerous examples of them in the process of piecing together Koval's life. At the National Archives, I actually uttered out loud, aha, <laughs> when I discovered a very helpful 250 page, uh, 250 plus page file. My wonderful husband, Marley, was there and probably remembers the moment. Um, <clears throat> And I must have been humming ahas when I walked the streets of Manhattan and the Bronx to map out where Koval and his fellow travelers had worked and lived. But of course, finding the details of Koval's time in Dayton from late June 1945 to early February 1946 was filled with aha moments. So, uh, so very interesting to me. Chapter nine of the book is devoted to what Koval did during those seven or so months as much as we can uh, uh, determine, uh, including who he dated. 
uh, a woman who was interviewed by the FBI in 1956 uh, told the agent that Coble played bridge with her family in Dayton every Sunday. She worked in the unit four of the Dayton site, a place many of you know about on Running Mead Road. It was once the Talbot's Playhouse. And she told agents that her mother wasn't fond of him because he would not talk much about his family or his background. She was suspicious of him, but it never occurred to her that he could have been a Soviet spy. Again, in Dayton, he was working as a health physicist. He and another health physicist on his team in Oak Ridge were sent to Dayton in June 1945, likely because of their work with polonium at the X-10 facility at Oak Ridge, a plant where polonium was synthesized by irradiating bismuth, way to produce polonium uh, for the trigger of the bomb. That was confirmed as the best method by uh, to uh, put together a supply of polonium by late spring 1945, thus putting more pressure on the Dayton site to produce more polonium and increasing the need for more health physicists knowledgeable about polonium. <clears throat> Researching and writing a chapter that focused on Dayton was indeed one of my favorite parts of the book. The research for a sleeper agent uh, overall was quite a challenge, but it was an adventure. And the same is true regarding uh, the story structure, which for this book was exciting to design. And I, I could spend the whole uh, rest of, well, all of next week talking about story structure, but I didn't see anybody bringing sleeping bags, so <laughs> I'll make it short. But uh, uh, the story structure for this book really was exciting to design. I did the usual story structure sketches, but this time the process of figuring out the best way to tell the story was more satisfying than usual. Uh, the components just seemed so easily to fit together. There was a natural flow to the storyline, which makes the book uh, a good example, I think, of how story structure can work in a narrative nonfiction book. I must say here that my favorite part of writing is, it, maybe it's obvious, the story structure. I call it the core of the art of nonfiction writing. After all, art is always about selection, right? Selecting in, selecting out. Story structure is about the selection of details from your research, your reporting, what to include, what to exclude, what to put before and after what. It's obviously the order of things. And it seems very basic, but it's also very, very profound because it's the part the reader doesn't even notice. It has to work right. It's the hidden struts and braces beneath the hull. And I see it as a great mix of discipline and creativity because sketching out the story structure uh, provides guidelines that allow the release of creativity <coughs> for the writing process. Story structure translates passion into form. You know, it's about, it's about music, it's about cadence, uh, the, the cadence of the content of your story. So I, I will uh, say one other comment about story structure and that's uh, uh, that I first discovered it at the Wall Street Journal uh, where I had my very first editor there, a gentleman named Don Moffat, wonderful guy, uh, who was very into art and the art of story structure. And I think he was kind of obsessed with getting uh, reporters, uh, news writers, well, at least feature writers, away from using any formulaic methods. He wanted us all to think through each story very thoroughly, to analyze its components, and choose a structure that was best to capture the topic. And he was so into it that he assigned one of the writers in our group to do a front page story on Robert McKee. You may have heard of him. He, he was traveling the nation doing writing workshops uh, for screenwriters with an emphasis on story structure. McKee later wrote a book in which he said that a story, whether fiction or nonfiction, is a symphonic unity in which the structure seamlessly melds setting, character, and theme. 
to, uh, quote, to find the harmony, the writer must study the core elements of the story as if they were instruments of an orchestra, first separately and then in concert, unquote. Uh, it, it, sketching out the story structure is about finding the best way to present all that you've worked so hard to discover, to unearth. You must deliver it in an accessible, artful, compelling way. And to do that, you must know the components of your story as McKee taught. What absolutely must be included, what is most significant to the themes of the story, uh, what are the most dramatic and intriguing details? This is why uh, Sleeper Agent starts with the moment that George Coble in New York City realizes that, I mean, literally the moment uh, when uh, members of his uh, network don't appear at a meeting, uh, that he realizes he has to leave the country in October 1948. Anyhow, the greatest scenes, the most remarkable and startling facts, what is the essential background? What is it that the writer will never forget? Because that's what the reader will never forget. So you, you can teach yourself how to envision the structure by studying uh, good pieces of writing, actually dissecting them, like diagramming a sentence in a way. And uh, I bring that up because Mrs. Sipes, some of you probably had Mrs. Sipes at Oakwood years ago. She taught a wonderful uh, grammar class at Oakwood, and she's the one who taught us, you know, uh, how to diagram sentences. And I think of Mrs. Sipes every time I start to dissect a piece of writing um, to uh, figure out the best order of things for the story structure. But it's the same with movies. Uh, it, when you read a good book or you read a good movie, uh, read it again, go to the movie again, take a notebook with you and dissect it. Figure out why it's working. Uh, for now, no time to do that, of course. But uh, for you today, I must, as your visiting author, do some readings from Sleeper Agent. A few favorite parts which kind of brings me back to Don, Don Moffat again. I, maybe all writers never forget their first editors, but uh, all of Don's advice I've never forgotten. And uh, uh, those were the days when uh, uh, the editors were working so hard at the journal to, we, we had all kinds of weekend uh, workshops for writing and making feature writing the very best possible. It was really excellent. But anyhow, Don used to tell all of us, never fall in love with your own writing. <laughs> you know, you finish a front page story, go into his office and think, wow, he's going to tell me how great this was, you know. And no, he would tell you what wasn't, it could have been better. And just remember, never fall in love with your own writing. Well, and humility is very important. It expands with excellence. I really believe that. But I still have a few favorite parts I'm going to read you. <laughs> uh, just a few. So uh, do we have, uh, let's see, I think we have enough a little time uh, to do a few. Would you like to hear a few? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, that's good. Well, you have a choice. Either you can get a further lecture on story structure, <laughs> or I'll read, you, read to you. Yeah, okay. And so, as you'll notice, I was going to dedicate this book to the inventor of the post-it. <laughs> but my editor, these are color-coded. They all have meaning, by the way. Uh, but uh, my editor said, no, and now, no one's going to know who that is. And, you know, not, well, at any rate, so I didn't. <clears throat> All right, so, okay, so this is the beginning. This is the prologue. And if we were doing a lecture on story structure, I would have this, uh, you know, blackboard up here and show you that the prologue is, begins uh, the story in 1948, in October, when George Cover realizes he has to, <sighs> Get out of Dodge, as the saying goes. Sometimes the clues that should have been warnings are lost in a blur, only to be seen in hindsight. Caught in the need to move ahead, most people rush like speeding trains past the truths and half-truths tucked into the terrain they thought they knew. 
And so it would be for a man and a woman one evening in 1948 at New York City's Grand Central Palace, each soon to learn the timeless cost of missing clues. Okay, that's the beginning of the prologue. Then, and you have to remember that the woman that he has been dating in New York has no idea that he's a spy, of course. Uh, and, uh, um, and I think she was told that uh, his parents had died at an early age and he had grown up in an orphanage in Cleveland. That was uh, what she was told. So these are the last two paragraphs of the prologue. Uh, Though documents and interviews would someday expose parts of the truth about Koval's escape from America, some questions would never be answered, like what he was thinking as he watched the New York skyline diminish and the ocean's vast expanse draw near. Was he remembering the last time he had left America in May 1932 with his parents and his two brothers on a ship leaving from Pier 54, bound eventually for the Soviet Union? Were the details of his father's stories about being a Russian immigrant and seeing America for the first time in 1910? Did he have the manner of a professional lacking last minute hesitations or sentimentality as the ship passed by the great statue symbolizing the freedoms of the country that was his birthplace? And did he struggle to push back all thoughts of what and whom he was leaving behind? By November, Koval would be living in the Soviet Union in Moscow with his wife of 12 years, and he would soon reunite with his 65-year-old father, his mother, then 58, and one of his two brothers. What he told them about his past eight years in America on a quote unquote business trip for Soviet military intelligence is unknown. But one certain fact is that George Koval left the US just in time. And as anyone who knew him would likely say, his timing was always nearly perfect. Okay. So I think I'll read you next um, his return. Uh, oh, excuse me, spring allergies, not anything else. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> uh, so uh, yeah, and, and I'll read you this partly out of sort of dedication to my uh, wondrous uh, Russian translator, who is the so is the. Uh, uh, Slavic librarian at um, Miami, Masha Stepanova, and uh, because this was very difficult to find. Uh, I went through every ship manifest possible. I knew he had a false passport. There were three different names that were possible he was using. It was very difficult, and Masha and I kept digging and digging through documents, articles, uh, all kinds of uh, Russian language uh, material. And finally, she found a letter one day um, that revealed this, a letter he had written to his wife about his trip uh, back to America. So it, it was an amazingly wonderful find. So, and it's the beginning of chapter five, which is called Undercover in the Bronx. One September night in 1940, somewhere in the East China Sea, Mountainous waves were tossing a small cargo ship on which George Koval was en route from Vladivostok, a port in the far southeast corner of the Soviet Union, to San Francisco. Quote, we almost got into the center of a cyclone, unquote, he wrote in a letter to Mila, the rot, his wife. The rocking was huge, and all books and furniture were falling on us as we fell off our beds, unquote. Crossing 4,554 nautical miles, the trip would take more than three weeks, adding to Koval's six-day, 5,772-mile train journey from Moscow to Vladivostok. During the calm days, when the winds were a total delight, Koval wrote that he played chess or dominoes with the ship's captain and read stories to the captain's nine-year-old daughter, who called him Uncle Grisha. Bonding with the captain's family on such a long passage would prove essential when the ship docked in America. 
Though he carried a fake passport, Koval planned to help unload the cargo and then slip away possibly to a meeting place in the San Francisco Bay Area where he would be given whatever was needed for his continuing travels. Because it was a cargo ship, the Customs <laughs> Patrol didn't process entry papers for crew members returning in a quick turnaround to Vladivostok. Still, U.S. officials conducted a seemingly thorough inspection of the ship, during which Koval hid in a storage bench in the captain's quarters. <clears throat> Sitting on top were the captain, his wife, and his daughter. The English-speaking inspectors asked to see identification documents for the captain and his family, a process that apparently took longer than the little girl could tolerate. And so she looked up at her mother and asked in Russian, will Uncle Grisha have to stay under the couch much longer? <laughs> the mother smiled, said nothing, and continued to hold her daughter's hand while her husband focused on the officials. The calm response of the mother and father, plus the fact that the inspectors likely knew little, if any, Russian, or were simply paying no attention to a little girl's exchange <laughs> with her mother, saved the day for the Soviet spy. Soon, Kovo was boarding a train to New York City. <clears throat> now, the details about what happened when he was under the bench uh, were something that he revealed to one of his students many years later at Mendeleev uh, Institute in Moscow. Uh, the rest of it was from uh, all those letters Masha found. <clears throat> Let's see, I can't see the clock with these. Do I have time for like two more readings? Sure. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. So um, I think now is the <clears throat> time to go to uh, <clears throat> Dayton. Oh, we're already here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Dayton. <clears throat> Already here, already had it marked. Okay, I want to just read you the very beginning of the Playhouse Secret, which is chapter nine, which gets deeply into Polonium. And uh, uh, thanks to that 450 page, thanks to two really great sources, that 450 page document from 1956 and the Monsanto 1969. Uh, pamphlet that they released and a wonderful book that some of you have probably read, the biography of Charles Thomas by his granddaughter. But at any rate, the first paragraph, and I will give you an aside, I, you know, show you the uh, inside of an author's life and relationship with her editor. Um, when I first turned this in, there was a huge paragraph that listed all the inventions that had come out of Dayton, because I'm so proud of Dayton. I love this place. And I, you know, I, I think people should know that Dayton is basically was the startup capital for the first half of the 20th century. So I had this long paragraph of everything, you know, pop-up cans, step ladder, all, everything, Colonel Dietz, uh, Kettering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was so impressive. So my editor called me one day and said, yes, very interesting. <laughs> very interesting to learn about Dayton. The, these were all invented in Dayton. I said, well, that is just a small portion of it. And I said, maybe what we should do is have a page in the source notes with all of them. And so there's this silence on the other end. And I said, yeah, I realize you're very proud of Dayton. Uh, I think we should move those that you've already put in chapter nine to the source notes. And I don't think we need a whole page with the details about the inventions of Dayton. Perhaps you'll write about that later. And I said, okay, Bob, you know, but uh, at first I don't think he believed it. And then, you know, he did He uh, very trusting and he knew it was right. But at any rate, just wanted you to know I was out there pushing Dayton. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but anyhow. The motives for crafting secrets have never changed, whether to protect, betray, or empower. Nor has the fact that the longer a secret is buried, the greater the chances its role in history may never be recognized. Such was the case of what happened in Dayton, Ohio, in a hidden room in the mansion of the Manhattan Project, a secret within the secret, and one that would remain unknown for many decades much like its on-site Soviet spy. 
So that is the uh, first paragraph uh, that sort of leads people into uh, more about Dayton. And I think you'll really like that chapter. <clears throat> Um, I just love the study, the nuclear science. Um, it was a lot of work, but it was really certainly worth it, especially the details of the polonium. <clears throat> um, okay, so then uh, two more quickly, and then we'll take questions. Does that sound right, Elizabeth? Okay, so uh, this is chapter 13. This is the closing chapter of part two. Uh, which brings the reader back to the year that he uh, eventually brings the reader back to the year that he left. But this is after leaving uh, the army in February 1946, and he returns to New York. And <clears throat> from the point of view of his landlady, George Coble could be best described as an earnest student and a true loner. Since his move to Valentine Avenue in 1946, Mrs. Gardner, the landlady, had observed his daily routine of leaving early each morning, returning several hours after dinner, and quietly walking up the four flights of stairs to his apartment. She assumed he would spend the rest of the evening doing all that good students do. The fact that he earned his uh, City College of New York degree in two years did not surprise her, largely because his studies were the center of his life, from her point of view, that is. To Mrs. Gardner, Coble was a timid, remote man who appeared to be burdened by a sad past. This was likely because, as he told her, he had lost both parents at a very young age and was raised in an orphanage in Cleveland, Ohio. Quote, he supposedly had one aunt who never took much interest in him, Mrs. G. Gardner told the FBI later, and he appeared to be very poorly fixed financially, unquote. However, when away from Valentine Avenue, Coble was no melancholy introvert bordering on poverty. As one of his CCNY friends would later say, George was very popular at school. Everybody liked George. And because he was older than most of his classmates, he had a moderating influence in virtually all forms of discussion. He had this great reputation for being quite the ladies man. And there are many endless stories about George. So anyhow, that's uh, to sort of show you uh, uh, the difference between his ways to act as in his double life. Okay, so I'm going to close with um, with chapter 17, which is the closing chapter before the epilogue, um, uh, because it, it kind of uh, is relevant and also uh, is a glimpse into his life uh, once he returned to the Soviet Union, which is what part three of the book is. Uh, chapter 17, Exposed. The grand opening of the newly constructed U.S. Embassy in Moscow in May 2000 was one of those events that seemed to exalt and shame simultaneously. Pride must have glazed the walls as the speeches rolled out and the glasses clinked, for there was no doubt that the postmodern building of stone and glass was quite an architectural and political accomplishment. At the same time, the occasion was a disturbing reminder that the entire project had taken more than 30 years to complete, a time during which high profile gaffes had earned America's Moscow embassy such headline images as, quote, bungled and bugged, unquote. After a 1969 agreement to proceed with a new embassy, the construction finally began in the fall of 1979 with directives calling for the Soviet Union to use its own labor and materials to build the basic structure. The host country was legally given the right to review architectural drawings for the building's frame, quote, to ensure that it met local Soviet building codes and standards, unquote. But six years later, the Soviet workers were ejected from the site and work was suspended 
after Soviet listening devices implanted in concrete pillars were found in the structural shell of the building. And it would take many more years for the United States and the Soviet Union to agree to a solution for dealing with such permanent eavesdropping systems, while Americans debated the prickly issue of slipshod scrutiny. As former Defense Secretary and CIA Chief James Schlesinger said at the time of the discovery, I told you that quote earlier, uh, the culprit is uh, often American complacency, the tendency to assume that the Russians are technically inferior to us and that we can always handle them, unquote. <clears throat> Through the years, there had been attempts to plant devices at the old embassy, which had opened in 1953, such as the Soviet's gift of a large replica of the Great Seal of the United States, replete with a tiny listening mechanism found only after it had been hanging on the wall of the U.S. ambassador's study for nearly two decades. <laughs> then in the 1960s, 40 microphones had been found in the embassy walls, and in the 1980s, bugs were discovered in at least a dozen electric typewriters, one of them used by the secretary of the second-ranking embassy diplomat. These were sensors capable of picking up the contents of typed documents. There were also the honey trap cases, including a scandal around the same time as the shocking find at the new embassy construction site. <clears throat> this one involved a Marine security guard arrested and soon convicted of espionage after his affair with a Soviet woman working at the US embassy. The woman had a KGB handler. Perhaps there would always be walls with ears at the embassy, though what was learned by such astute listening was not always picked up by the press. In 1999, for example, a somewhat significant spy story moved across the embassy landscape, missed by the media searchlight. In early June, a thin, stooped, bespectacled 85-year-old George Kovel entered the American embassy without notice. 40 years after U.S. officials had invited him to do so. Okay, so uh, uh, a few, uh, let's see, what, six uh, little excerpts from the book. Uh, I hope you enjoyed them. And so I think that that's, uh, I will uh, close, well, I'll close with my hopes for the book, uh, which I put at the end of the notes. Um, my hope is twofold that Sleeper Agent will deepen the reader's understanding of the intriguing psychology of a spy and of the timeless costs of oppression, and that it will be helpful to future researchers by contributing to the step-by-step -step process of prying open the closed chapters in the story of Soviet espionage uh, in America. So uh, that's it for the official presentation. Thank you. <laughs> where we, we are. Do have time for questions? If there are any yeah, questions. if there are any questions, uh, if my class is on here. And take a little sip of water. Uh, uh, OK. Okay, you first. Uh, well, the right over there, yeah. You, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for your for your talk. Um, can you give us some sense, Anne, of the breadth of the number of people who now knew while while he was in date? Um, was it a few, a lot? And of the people we knew, was it um, across the broad swath of Asian society, or no. more concentrated? No, in the uh, in the uh, interview that the FBI did with uh, the gentleman who was his roommate and also his teammate in health physics in Oak Ridge, they came together. Uh, he said that George worked uh, six hours, or he worked six days a week, ten hours a day. He had no social life except for uh, playing bridge with his girlfriend's parents. And you know, his girlfriend, uh, she worked at Unit 4, uh, the Runnymede Playhouse, and uh, so did her sister. 
And so did George. I mean, he, he worked at all units because he was a health physicist, but I mean, largely that one. And so I think his life was just, uh, that's how it was described, just all about work. So, you know, I tried to expand uh, his social life as much as I could in Dayton and asked, uh, did a lot of exploring with that, but never really found anything. I thought maybe he played on the baseball team or something and did that kind of research, which I did at Oak Ridge to uh, uh, try to, went through all old newspapers and all the Oak Ridge uh, dailies to try to find photos. But, you know, he was very well trained. And, you know, there were all these details from his past in Iowa, and he wasn't going to reveal any hints of any of those. And so, uh, um, and I think by the time he got here, uh, that, that was a very serious job working on the colonium issues. Uh, and so I don't think he did have much of a social life, but, you know, uh, if you find out anything, let me know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, this gentleman. Yes. Is, is, yeah. Yeah. Were you able to obtain any access to Soviet archives or records? Because obviously the GRU right. would know everything about. Oh yeah. This oh yeah. Lots, lots through a GRU historian mm -hmm. who wrote articles about George and uh, Masha translated those and. Also, uh, the uh, Russian Ministry of Atomic Energy, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, a lot, but uh, not as you know, not enough to satisfy me because I couldn't go uh, go there and visit, you know, and that kind of uh, was very frustrating. I mean, my editor kept saying, "Ann, this is a story about America. It's not a story." about Russia, you don't have to go there, but I always go where the story is. But because of COVID, there was no way to do that. So, but Masha, you know, was excellent and she was digging, digging, digging. So she found many and translated them, yeah. Yeah, and Great. one was a GRU historian who wrote uh, two books that involved chapters about George, yeah. So. So there's still part of the story locked up. Um, I'm not so sure about that because uh, there's a biography was released in November by a gentleman uh, in uh, Russia about George and Masha has been reading it. It's like 850 pages or something. And um, she's been reading it. And, and I think he's been, he dug through documents. So that, I mean, the one thing I really want to know and if I could have just interviewed him you know, I mean, there are many questions I would have asked him, but of course, you know, like what really was your motive here? Why did you do this? Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things was his courier. I mean, we know who his handler was. We know that most everything went out through the Soviet consulate, um, East 60th or whatever in New York. And they stopped sending at about the time the Soviet consulate uh, shut down so uh, in the night, late 1940s. So I'm pretty sure that's the way where it was, but I never found that. And I also never found exactly where he was trained outside of Moscow. <laughs> there are a couple things I, that, you know, and maybe someday I will. So I don't know. But anyhow, uh, yes. All the documentation here. Did you come across anyone who questioned the wisdom of granting his security clearance? <laughs> oh, <laughs> not really. I mean, I just spent last week uh, in uh, Oak Ridge and uh, asked a couple people about that. And actually, uh, because he had been in the Army Special uh, Specialized Training Program, that and then he was in the Special Engineer Detachment. Those were very elite groups, and they it, it, to get into those groups um, before he went to Oak Ridge, um, he had they he had to uh, be cleared, and so that you know that clearance which went through the U.S. Army um, 
was really enough. And, you know, there was a, a great deal of security at Oak Ridge. There's a lot in the book about uh, their security because I found an archive that tells, it went into great details about uh, the Oak Ridge security system. So, uh, yeah. So I, you know, I, I think that uh, basically, you know, it, 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 he was, he passed all the tests, you know, he, he got through all the doors. And that is one of the reasons why once he got out of the army in February of 1946, he went back to New York and kept a very, very low profile. He was offered a wonderful job at Monsanto. Um, Charles Thomas wanted him to stay here and it, it was a good job, but he knew that the minute he was out of the army, that the uh, security, uh, you know, research on him could be damaging, you know, because when you read the book, you see that he had an arrest record from 1931, 1930. He was the head of young communists for uh, the state of Iowa at a conference in Chicago. There were records on him and all they had to do was, you know, dig, but, Anyhow, so, you know, he was very smart. He was very well trained. And so he kept his distance and he kept a low profile, I think, when he was supposed to. But so, anyhow, does that answer your question, sort of? Well, you had that gap in his uh, life, too, when he left the United States, was in the Soviet Union, came back under a false passport. How did he account for that? Period? Oh, yeah. Well, that, it, yeah. And the orphanage. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no. You you have to read the book and you'll see okay. because uh, <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> selling books. Yeah, but no. Uh, but that's the truth. Um, yeah, because he, he had an uncle and who had a company in uh, in Iowa, and he put that on his uh, application form and you know saying that he moved to New York at such and such a time. And then he very smartly, when he got back, he registered for the army in January of 1941, you know, three, two and a half months after coming back, that, that made it look like, okay. And then he filled all that out, all of his work in Iowa in the 1930s, that would have been backed up by his uncle easily and uh and cousins and so uh so you know so then he was established as someone who had just moved to new york and registered at the local bronx you know uh official station to register so army station so yeah so he had a you know this guy graduated from high school and when he was 15 years old. And, and so he, he was a bright guy, but also I think the difference between his training and some of the walk-in spies who were caught, the ones that we read about for years, is that he was trained by the military, the Soviet military. Big difference, I think. But let's see, okay, you, who was next? That guy. Yeah. Thanks very much for your comments about Mrs. Seif. That was interesting. Don't forget her husband was a physics teacher who affected lots of people's lives too. It, it oh my gosh. Two, two family benefited Oakwood. But my question to you is, is uh, and thanks very thoroughly covering everything, but was was Cobol's contribution to the Russians uh, uh, knowledge of equal importance or greater importance than that it was leaked from Los Alamos. Yeah, excellent question. And uh, I can answer it partly. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, I would say uh, definitely equally important because Klaus Fuchs sent the uh, information on plutonium. And what George sent about plutonium confirmed what Klaus Fuchs had already okay. sent. And that took away all the question marks for Kurchatov, who was running the science of the atomic bomb, the Soviet's atomic bomb, because anytime they got, um, you know, intelligence from America, there was big skepticism. This could be misinformation. This could be because, you know, every second counted as they were building this bomb. So and what the, yeah. And so that validation was crucial. But then take it to the next step, and it's the polonium. And no one else, as far as it's known, sent a recipe for polonium. And polonium, when you read about it, 
Some of you in this room have read about it, I'm sure. It, it was very difficult to figure out how to produce enough polonium for the uh, triggers of those two atomic bombs. And so the uh, uh, once it was figured out, oh, you know, uh, that was big. And he said that, and the proof of that came out in the March 1st, 1949 report that was sent to Beria, uh, the head of, of uh, internal security and also the head of the atomic entire atomic bomb project there. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, plus he sent information on safety issues. And it, it, toward the end of the Soviet bomb, uh, the, the Soviet project to, to produce their own bomb, you, you have to realize how crucial that was because you don't want to lose expertise right at the end. And so, yeah, so I think in three categories, confirming what Fuchs already sent, the polonium and cutting the time it took the Soviets to develop their bomb, because it, it, look how many years it took us to, to figure out the polonium. Um, you know, I mean, not a huge number, but two years. Uh, so uh, that Soviet espionage, and then later there was a quote from Kurchatov saying that 50% of, uh, he felt that Soviet scientists weren't given enough recognition for what they knew, at, but he said 50% of the, you know, what we used and the reason we developed it far quicker than anybody in the West thought we could was because of Soviet espionage. <laughs> So, yes. Do you know where in Iowa you live? In, where in Iowa? Yeah, Sioux City. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. All right. This this may be a lead for you too. Did you ever come across the name of Al, Dr. Alfred Large, and his wife's name was America, and they were at Los Alamos. And his primary job was to test radiation levels to make sure that the health of the workers was good. I have a personal connection with his, huh. his wife, America. Wow. Her maiden name was America Brent. Wow. But they married in St. Louis, and that was his job, was to go down to Los Alamos and make sure that everybody was safe on that project. Wow. So, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Alfred Large. Alfred Large. How do you spell his last name? L-A-R-G-E. Yeah, right. You got and it. My wife's first name was America. Yeah. America <laughs> Large. <laughs> <laughs> was she from Wyoming? No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Iowa. In Blackford, Missouri. Yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. When she was, you know, 16 or 17 in high school. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. It was a... Uh, um, was a dissertation written several years ago um, by Owen, P A G A N O. It was called Spy Who Stole the Urchin. Did you find that? Oh, yeah, George Washington University. Yes. Yeah, Did it was a senior that? thesis. Yeah. Correct. It yeah. Was, it was extremely interesting. Yeah. And I've it, always taken that as very factual. I mean, yeah. would you, now that you've done all this research, uh, would you consider it factual? Yeah. Maybe <laughs> most of it, yeah, most of it. yeah, okay. yeah, most of it. Very, very. Uh, uh, for a senior in college, it, it was, was remarkable. it was remarkable. I yeah, let me say good. that. Yeah, and it focused mostly on Dayton, from what I remember. This time at Dayton. Oh, I don't think so. Yeah, but it, it did mention it. Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, it was in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, yeah. That uh, I forgot about that. That was. Um, yeah, a very uh, impressive uh, senior thesis, really impressive, yeah. Yeah, uh, there was something in it that was really, really, uh, I, I think I have it in the source notes. I'm, I'm positive I had it in the source notes because there was something in there that was uh, uh, unique and I checked it out and it was true and now I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was about Dayton, I, yeah, I don't know. Well, it seems to me that was like really the first time I've ever, I've ever read in depth about yeah. this yeah. guy. Yeah. You know, and it was right here, you know, so it was like yeah. kind of remarkable. I know that, and I have to say that kept me motivated all through this because 
the those thousands of pages of FBI reports, and then you know the difficulty of tracking in part two is the story of how he interwove with the very famous spy networks, and you know to to figure all that stuff out was really a challenge. And the Canadian uh, GRU spies and that uh, part of the network, but. Um, but you know, one of the things that motivated me all the way through it was Dayton. I always, you know, I kept thinking I'm going to find out more and more and more about Dayton. And you know, there is a lot in here about it, but there are some missing links. Um, you know, uh, uh, like the family, you know, the woman he dated, and uh, I was always asking people about her and uh, that family and all kinds of things. And my editor. Yeah, you know, it's always saying, um, just like he did with the page full of Dayton inventions that he said you had not down. Uh, you know, you can't spend the whole time in researching Dayton. This is an international story. And so, uh, yeah, so at any rate, but yeah, yeah, I know exactly, uh, yeah, what you're talking about. And uh, like I said, that was, that was a good one. And, uh, and there was another one that was good. Uh, well, the the uh, there just weren't that many secondary sources except for the context. But uh, the one, uh, the granddaughter of Charles Thomas, that book that, that is an excellent book um, with a lot of details about Dayton. Really excellent. But uh, anyhow, so yes. Well, I, uh, you're talking about Dayton. You know, everybody's heard for eons about Los Alamos, Oak Ridge. Yeah. Dayton is just not up there. Right. With it. And, and it's, it's, is there a reason, my huh. opinion, as to why Dayton, you know, has never been elevated? Good that? question. You know, we just were in Oak Ridge last week, and one of my first questions is that you're getting tours and all these uh, wonderful people, you know, in charge of everything at Oak Ridge. Um, so much happening there still. And so one of my first questions, you know, very politely, I said, so I, I just think it's great. Hanford, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge. What about Dayton? You know, I'm sort of like the walking PR now for, you know, <laughs> what about Dayton? <laughs> it's, uh, but um, I think it's be, I, I don't know. There are probably people in this room who know what the politics were on why it didn't become a site. But I could tell you that, I've been crusading for it to become a site because it should be. The National Park Service should have it uh, in there just like they do with Oak Ridge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I don't know the details of that, but I can tell you I've been rooting for it. And uh, uh, there, like I said, there are people in this room who probably know why it was not included. Maybe it's because um, the playhouse was torn down. Maybe there's no... Uh, physical, you know, in Oak Ridge, you still have uh, K25, one of the plants. And um, Los Alamos has got, we've toured that, it's got lots. And, and it's got lots. And so it, it could be because there's nothing here that was, you know, can be toured and uh, turned into, uh, you know, the, you know, the Mount Museum it, it is wonderful. I mean, there's uh, a lot, I, I don't know, I can't answer the question, but it, it, some of the people in this room probably can. We could have a seminar in an hour and discuss it. But I would really like to know the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. Um, back to George. Um, so you, you say you've been married for 12 years, uh, somebody in Russia when you got back, you, you, uh -huh. you rejoined. And secondly, were there any repercussions on his uh, family in Iowa after he left and he was found out? Oh, uh, well, that's a very interesting question. His, his relatives in Iowa had all moved to LA by then. And, uh, and I, um, I think they were uh, not battered, but let's say they were uh, constantly, constantly uh, being questioned. Uh, over and over, the questioning just never stopped. Were they, were they at all? Um, well, um, he was discovered in July 1954. That's when uh, the Hoover uh, group uh, discovered him or confirmed 
that he had been uh, operating in the United States and they started documenting. They pursued members of his family just endlessly to try to put together all the details. Um, and so uh, I think there was a real problem for one of his relatives uh, who had visited him twice in the Soviet Union. Oh, yeah, in the, yeah. In the 1930s. And so there, there are many, many uh, pages, hundreds and hundreds of pages of yeah. interviews. Of yeah. Was there any correspondence that you dictated in your book about him and his wife during that eight-year period? Oh, yeah, there's, uh, yes, read the book. Oh, yeah, no, there, there is, yeah. So where is the book? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, where is available? Oh, where is available? Well, um, here, at let's hope Books and Company, uh, you know, Amazon, uh, the uh, Barnes and Noble, you know, I mean, it's uh, the, the paperback, the hard copy came out on July 20th, and the uh, paperback comes out on uh, June 28th. Yeah, this year. Yeah, soon. And so, uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, we were going to arrange something for today, but, um, but you know, the library is, it, this is a wonderful public gathering, and it's not a, about selling books, but the, the um, but do remember. <laughs> Sorry. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's the co comedy always comes next after you write six and write non fiction books. I think. <laughs> Well, okay. I just want to say we yeah. do have yeah. copies in the library, yeah. it, but also please purchase. Yeah, them. please purchase. And also, uh, I have some in the car. But... <laughs> <laughs> Will you sell out of your truck? <laughs> yeah, sell out of the truck. Yeah. I'm just kidding. But um, but anyhow, yeah, you, you can find them uh, many different places online. Um, and I think on the website, because Simon Schuster made me modernize with this book. So there's a website, www.annhagedorn.com. And I think it shows uh, places you can uh, connect, uh, you know, bookstores. But, you know, Books and Company, I mean, I hope Books and Company has a stash of them. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. When will you know that you get the Edgar Award? Oh, well, uh, April 28th. Ooh. Yeah, so I, I'm just honored to be a finalist. There's six of us, and so I'm honored. That's that's really good, you know. But, uh, you know, you can't think about those things. Like I tell students, you can't think about fame and fortune when you're writing a book, only after you finish the book. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, yeah, so it's April 28th. It's a big uh, event in New York on the 28th, yeah. I don't know. So, don't but I, I'm not thinking anybody. about it because I'm just honored that they would make me a finalist. Yeah. Yes, sir. I only have one or two. Uh, I only have one or two million questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> I yeah. want to try to keep it short. Uh, first of all, at the yes. beginning, you said that he had gotten a BS yes. physics course at Columbia, and then yeah. later you mentioned that he had gone to CCNY. Right. My first question is did he ever get a degree in it? The yes. second one is, Oh, you said when he entered the service, he was a corporal. Did he ever rise to a higher rank? Because it seems pretty weird that someone that low in the rank would have access to such important material. Okay, so in answer to that question, first, um, basically, um, that's because of his job as health physicist. Yeah, and because he was... Um, there was a test, the Army classification test they took yes. at the Citadel, and if you got above 115 in the test, then that put you above average. He got 152 on the test. He was immediately put into the Army Specialized Training Program and sent to CCNY for one year of scientific uh, studies in chemistry and physics. Uh, and uh, and then uh, he he returned and, and then he was uh, one of uh, there were thirty nine of them that went from the Citadel to uh, CCNY for the ASTP program. Then eleven out of the ASTP program were 
elevated to something called special engineer detachment. And those were trained scientists who were taken to different sites of the Manhattan Project to help assist science scientists. Um, and he was one of those. And so uh, uh, that's why if he wasn't high up in the army, he was pushed up in the science uh, area. And of course, science, scientific expertise was hugely needed. And so he was a star in that way, it appears. Uh, but at any rate, um, uh, and then uh, your other question. Oh, yeah. And then he did, he got a degree from CCNY. He already had a degree in chemistry from Mendeleev Institute. He got that in 1939. Yeah, in, in Moscow. And of course, that's why he was such a star in all of the science. They, you know, nobody had any clue. He was this uh, kid from Iowa who'd been working for his uncle for years and moved to New York and got drafted. And uh, they didn't know that he had a uh, five years of studies at Mendeleev Institute in gaseous, uh, gaseous, uh, rare gases. That's what his specialty was. Whoa. In chemical weapons, which was his assignment from the GRU. Yeah. So does that does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So okay. he was more than a corporal. Yeah, he was more than a corporal. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. But anyhow, and there's a lot about the science uh, spy, uh, the plan to. Uh, uh, send uh, sciences, science students from the Soviet Union to be spies in America in the 1930s. And that went on into the 1940s. It, it was that an was amazing Stalin. program. Mm -hmm. Under Stalin. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah. I'm assuming he didn't put that degree from Mendeleev. University. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and you know, and that's why you know, uh, you know, one of his colleagues, Arnold Kramer, she's in the book. Uh, uh, I'm so sorry, Arnold passed away in 2010. I would love to have interviewed him, but anyhow, one of he was one of the his colleagues at Oak Ridge. He, you know, everybody wondered. He, he's so smart, you know, and he was smart anyhow, but it, they didn't know that, uh, especially when he was at CCNY, they didn't know, you know, uh, that he already had a degree, <laughs> everything he was taking. But at, at any rate, yeah. I already had that. <laughs> so yeah. I was an ace. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Now we all wish we could go back and do it again. Yeah. But at any rate, any other questions? Uh, Just a comment. Yes. Um, my friend Google and I have been back there working, and um, there's a website, course for Carolyn Parker, information about what we've been talking about. Yeah. But I have never heard of the Islamic Heritage Foundation. It has pictures of all the buildings. Yeah. For Dayton, Ohio. So, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, they should get uh, lots of attention on this, so I hope. Uh, at any rate, um, so the, the what? You can't go a day without Dayton. That's right. <laughs> Every time you flip a can, you remember it was invented here. <laughs> Stand on a stepladder. But uh, at any 